Uh, I think that you're, you're uh, going to really like this, this next panel, um, Evidence-Based Food Policy Through a Health Equity Lens. Thanks to Allison for helping me with the name on that one. We had a different name for the, uh, but uh, moderating this panel will be uh, uh, Sakina Shabazz, did I say that? Yeah, Senior Policy Advisor at USDA's Food and Nutrition Service. Uh, she took that role on just a couple months ago, and uh, prior to joining the Biden administration, she served as Policy Director of the Berkeley Food Institute. Um, and we are thrilled to have her with us moderating this panel. Uh, and so I'm gonna get off the stage and, and see to them uh, Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I'm putting the clicker back over here. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Are we, we've had water, we've had lunch, everyone's feeling good. Maybe a little coffee if you need some. Um, Thomas, thank you for those kind introductory remarks and inviting me here today to moderate this esteemed panel um, focused on evidence-based food policy through a health equity lens. Uh, my name is Sakina Shabazz, and I am a political appointee of the Biden-Harris administration, and I am currently serving as the senior policy advisor for food and nutrition at the USDA Food and Nutrition Service um, in Alexandria. And I also wanted to plug that tomorrow you will hear from Administrator Cindy Long of the Food and Nutrition Service for tomorrow's keynote remarks. Um, uh, she'll be discussing a lot of the fantastic work being done at our agency that we have underway to advance food and nutrition security. I wanted to briefly introduce myself uh, since I just started at the USDA um, in my new role, and this is one of the first national conferences that I'm participating in in a specific capacity. My portfolio at the USDA includes the Food and Nutrition Security Initiative, which is led by Dr. Kari Cotwright, who couldn't be here today, and with a lot of support from Dr. Sheila Fleischaker, um, both of whom send their regards from spring break with much needed time off right now. <coughs> My role at the USDA also includes engaging with US territories on food and nutrition service programs and policies, and working on local and regional food systems, interagency work on homelessness, veterans, and youth, and also monitoring updates related to the Thrifty Food Plan. Most recently, I worked at the UC Berkeley, Berkeley Food Institute under the College of Natural Resources, where I managed local, state, and federal policy engagement. This included co-teaching a graduate seminar on the US Farm Bill, that was a lot of fun, managing coalition engagement with statewide partners, working closely with UC Berkeley students, faculty, and staff on food systems related policy and research projects. I've also worked in and out of Washington DC and also am a graduate of Georgetown University. There are many, many familiar faces in here. I am in good company, we are all in good company today. Um, while most of my upbringing was in San Diego, California, uh, my family roots are very Southern, reaching back to Louisiana and North Carolina and Tennessee. Uh, my grandmother, Mary, who uh, it is good to invoke her in this space, uh, worked for the city of San Diego for many years, but she was also a school lunch lady at my elementary school where my siblings and cousins and I attended and also where my mother attended. So the importance of school meals have been around for a really, really long time in my family. My mother is also a Head Start preschool teacher, which she has been doing for more than 20 years, and is deeply knowledgeable of the child and adult care food program, child development, and the importance of supplemental nutrition programs that we all care about as well. Part of my role at USDA is celebrating all the work of our partners and what they're doing, especially related to the historic White House Conference on ending hunger and improving nutrition and physical activity and reducing diet-related diseases and the disparities that accompany that. But to reach those ambitious goals, my role also includes challenging each of us to do better together. As others have mentioned today, the historic White House Conference catalyzed the public and private sector to work together to accelerate progress and to drive transformative change in the US related to these issues. While, we're, while we are excited about the progress to date, each of us knows well here today that we need to do more to integrate evidence-based food policy through a health equity lens. For the first time, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee has been charged with adopting a health equity lens in its scientific review. The goal is to formulate nutrition advice that is relevant to people with diverse racial, 
ethnic, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds, but more broadly, disparities in the burden of diet-related diseases has fueled calls for integrating equity considerations into food policy writ large. This afternoon, this esteemed panel will explore the rationale for applying a health equity lens to food policy and the impact on specific areas such as school meals, nutrition education, advertising regulation, and federal nutrition assistance programs. We'll first have Dr. Allison Brown, who is a project director at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, kick us off with a federal perspective from building from a funding agency about how we are investing and in building the evidence base to inform food policy, increasingly using a health equity lens. After Dr. Brown, Dr. Warren will provide an academic perspective of using evidence-based research around food policy, also using a health equity lens. We'll then hop over to Sherry Fry, and she will provide insights from Nielsen IQ Analytics to integrate consumer perspectives on this conversation. And our final, our final panelist today will be Dr. Stephanie Goodwin, who is the Director of Nutrition Policy at Danone North America, and will share how a food company is helping to translate evidence-based food policy into their policies and practices and products, and how her company is using a health equity lens. Without question, we have an excellent panel here today, and we'll aim for each of them to present, and then we'll use the remaining time and networking to break down any questions that you all might have. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Brown. Thank you, Sakina, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation and planning this great panel today. Um, so as Sakina mentioned, my name is Allison Brown, and I serve as a program director at NIH's National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, um, particularly in their division of cardiovascular sciences. And I'm really excited to share out about an NIH workshop that we held this past fall. So first, I'd like to state the disclaimer that this, the content of this presentation is solely my own and do not necessarily represent the official views of HHS or NIH. Um, so to start us off, why do we need a health equity lens? Uh, so it goes without saying, but there are glaring disparities in diet-related diseases, not only by race and ethnicity, but also by socioeconomic status. And these include diet-related diseases such as obesity, cancer, hypertension, heart disease, um, as well as diabetes. And as many of you all are aware, by 2050, it's estimated by that one in three adults in the U.S. will have type 2 diabetes. But as you can imagine, these rates will be higher for racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. Um, so based on data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, about 46.8% of non-Hispanic Hispanic blacks have obesity compared to 40.4% of Hispanics and 35.9% of whites. Uh, when looking at hypertension, about 50% of blacks have high blood pressure compared to 37 0.6% of whites, and 27.9% of Hispanic adults. And these trends are consistent across various uh, levels of education, um, but particularly when whites have a lower education, um, they are more likely to have higher risk for disease, but these trends are not consistent for racialized communities, particularly blacks and Hispanics, where even at higher levels of education, we see these uh, disparities persist. So again, there's something else going on, potentially stress, environmental exposures, and other factors that contribute to these disparities. So another indication that we need a, a health equity lens um, is particularly because our nation is becoming increasing, increasingly diverse. So as early as 2008, news reports highlighted that the country may become majority minority in the next generations. And these, per, these reports persisted over the next two decades with news highlighting, again, that the country will become a majority minority by as early as 2045. Um, there is new terminology as well in terms of cultural plurality because the, the minority majority language uh, consistently and permanently minoritizes non-white communities. So again, kind of moving towards this cultural plurality where no single racial ethnic group will be dominant in the United States. Uh, but overall, the increasing diversity of our nation 
really does call for the need for a cultural perspective and considerations in developing solutions to address these uh, widening disparities. So to facilitate the conversation, uh, the NIH hosted a two-day virtual workshop titled Advancing Health Equity Through Culture-Centered Dietary Interventions to Address Chronic Diseases. This was held this past September and organized in collaboration with several federal partners, sev several of whom are in the room today. So colleagues from CDC, the Indian Health Service, the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, as well as USDA. So again, a very uh, trans-federal uh, agency partner partnership. And in this workshop, we convene not only researchers, but also healthcare providers, community representatives, government officials, to really understand and discuss the pivotal role that culture plays in um, shaping diet and how it's so important to integrate into dietary interventions aimed at diverse populations and those underrepresented in re research. So the goals of the workshop were threefold. Uh, one, to review how cultural foodways and sociocultural factors could be leveraged to improve the effectiveness of dietary interventions among diverse groups. So we know uh, diets that are evidence-based, such as the DASH diet, Mediterranean diets, um, those diets can be culturally adapted, but how? And the, the, the workshop convened researchers to talk about that. Um, it also included discussions around identification of gaps and opportunities for research around cultural tailoring. And then lastly, it examined the influence of cultural-related factors on the biological mechanisms. So how does diet and changes in diet impact the microbiome, uh, metabolomics, and other biological factors? So again, the, the workshop was very timely as well, considering the convening of the dietary guidelines and the particular focus on health equity. So again, it was a great opportunity for federal agencies to partner and convene and talk about this important and timely topic. So the, the two-day workshop, it convened nearly 1,500 virtual attendees. And the idea, you know, we just coming out of the pandemic, we could have held it in person, but we opted to hold it virtually, again, to, to make it more inclusive, particularly for smaller CBOs that may not have the budget to attend a federal conference. So we really wanted to expand the audience. And it's centered around eight specific panel discussions. So the first day, uh, the panel started off with a workshop, or sorry, a panel on cultural aspects of food and diet and implications for dietary intervention research. And the next four panels focus on the racial and ethnic groups as uh, de defined by the Office of Ban uh, Management and Budget. Um, so the first pa panel focused on sociocultural factors influencing the foodways and food sovereignty of Native American communities. The second focused on dietary interventions tailoring uh, and tailored for black communities of diverse social cultural experiences in the US. Uh, the next uh, panel focused on migration and acculturation and dietary inter interventions among diverse Hispanic and Latino communities. And then the last but not least panel on that first day focused on cultural considerations for dietary interventions among the diverse Asian and Pacific Islander populations. Then we moved on to day two of the workshop um, and it started off with a, po uh, a panel with our USDA and HHS colleagues speaking on the topic of developing evidence-based dietary interventions for, di uh, for diverse populations, followed by a panel at, again, the more biological mechanisms, looking at precision nutrition, a uh, culture and diet. Uh, then the final panel uh, really provided an opportunity for community-based organizations working on the ground that have translated the science into, um, into practice. It allowed them to highlight the work that they were doing in, on, uh, on the ground in the community. So over the course of the two days, obviously NIH's focus is on research, so we highlighted key research gaps and opportunities. Um, and uh, I highlight a few on the next slide. Um, so sorry for all of the text here, um, but uh, just a, a few gaps and opportunities that we highlighted in, com, included a developing dietary guidance uh, that are culturally adaptive, again, very timely for the dietary guidelines, um, and emphasizing the importance of focusing on traditional foods and eating patterns across diverse communities. Uh, also, there was a discussion around the importance of examining the efficacy of grassroots food sovereignty initiatives, which are particularly important for our indigenous populations and communities. Um, in terms of the U.S. black population, uh, we talked about the need for more research to assess the sustainability and effectiveness of plant-based dietary interventions. 
Also, given the increasing reliance on technology, there's a need for the design um, and investigation of the efficacy of various technological platforms uh, to engage different uh, segments of the Hispanic population. And then in terms of the Asian American communities, uh, there was the expression to the need to evaluate the effectiveness of culturally tailored dietary interventions within, again, the very diverse South Asian populations uh, that really consider culture, religion, social networks, and re regional variations. Um, and then specific to the accuracy of dietary assessments and analysis, we had um, a great conversations with our USDA partners, but there was the identification of the need for more inclusive and a broader range of foods that are available in our USDA's food and nutrition di di uh, databases uh, in order to inform dietary studies. And then lastly, in terms of biological mechanisms, we need to do more research on the consequences of lower dietary fiber intake on uh, changes in the gut microbiota, particularly among immigrant communities. Uh, but overall, there was this recognition of the need to acknowledge the heterogeneity among the various racial and ethnic groups uh, in the U.S. So personally, I come from a bicultural background. My dad is from Trinidad and Tobago. My mom is African American. So again, really considering that heterogeneity and diversity within the racial ethnic groups within uh, the country. So this lends... Uh, me to the next slide of the six different cross-cutting themes that we identified. So first and foremost, needing to elevate health equity and inc inclusivity, not only in the design of interventions, but also the need for more inclusive, equitable health guidelines, which not only consider the biological factors, but also those socio-cultural factors. Uh, the second theme was the uh, need for community-centered approaches and ensuring that communities are engaged from the planning stages of research, as well as uh, the implementation of the actual research. Um, and given the nature of this type of research, the need for interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary teams. So by nature, nutrition is very interdisciplinary and it really calls for multiple sector sectors as well to be involved. Um, given the digital age that we're in, we need to, there was a theme for more technological innovations and using relevant platforms to increase engagement of dietary interventions, particularly for time-constrained individuals who may not be able to go in person for an intervention. Then there was a cross-cutting theme of needing to identify structural and economic factors and considering these in the development of interventions and considering the economic constraints that people often face. Um, and then lastly, there was the need to recognize, again, these social cultural nuances when working in diverse communities. So in the last panel that I was in, kind of talking about what does a meal actually look like, some people and a lot of people do not consume three strict meals a day, you know, and considering that through the cultural lens. Also food uh, presentation and then barriers to healthy eating. So overall, the, the workshop, the hope is to inform policy um, and evidence-based solutions going forward, um, and it really does highlight the need, again, for this health equity perspective. So this is a link to uh, the NHLBI's uh, workshop executive uh, report. So after this, uh, after this presentation, if you would like to learn more about the gaps and opportunities, please feel free to go here. At this point, we're working uh, with our collaborators and the panelists on a workshop proceedings manuscript that will be published in the Journal of Nutrition Education. So we're really excited about that. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to the Q&A. Dr. Brown, that was a fantastic presentation. And next up, we will have Dr. Warren. Hello, and thank you to all my friends and relations here today. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Donald Warren. I'm Oglala, Lakota, originally from a small town called Kyle, South Dakota, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And I always like to ask, how many people have been to Kyle, South Dakota? Two, that's two more than usual, so very, very, very impressive, very small community. Uh, I am a family physician, also have training in public health and health policy, and I currently serve as the co-director of the Center for Indigenous Health at Johns Hopkins University, and I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest or interesting conflicts uh, to, to describe. 
So what I'll talk about just very briefly um, in 10 minutes or less is a, a brief description of our Center for Indigenous Health at Johns Hopkins. We'll also look at the impact of the loss of food systems and food sovereignty on indigenous peoples and how replacement of those foods with uh, unhealthy and, and uh, often, oftentimes very processed foods. I know that's been a topic of discussion in this particular conference. Then we have terrible health disparities, obviously, in terms of obesity-related uh, diseases, type 2 diabetes, some forms of cancer, certainly heart disease. And then let's also think about the risk factors. In addition to uh, poverty and marginalization, some of the other challenges we face are exclusion from data sets. And I would say when we're thinking about health equity and working with indigenous peoples, the first step include us in your data sets, right? How often are, are things reported where we're not even a part of the discussion? So I think the first step toward equity is that we need to actually be on the agenda and part of those important discussions. So our Center for Indigenous Health was founded in 1991, but it's based in work that started in the 1980s. And in Arizona, there were a couple of tribes who were having terrible outcomes with uh, children and young babies uh, dying from dehydration due to infectious diarrhea. So a team from Johns Hopkins went out to the tribes in Arizona to develop an oral rehydration solution, which eventually became Pedialyte. So if you've ever used Pedialyte, that actually originated from the work out of our Johns Hopkins, at the time, Center for American Indian Health, now Center for Indigenous Health. And we work in partnership with communities to advance indigenous well-being and health leadership to the highest level. And our vision is thriving indigenous communities worldwide, which certainly includes uh, nutrition-related health disparities and trying to counter some of the impact of historical policies. So we have four areas of work, policy and advocacy. So obviously this is an important uh, arena for us as a center. We also do research and evaluation. So really important to look at the research agendas that are being uh, put forth and ensuring that our communities are included in those research projects. Uh, also education and training. We're in process of developing what will be the world's first DRPH with an indigenous health concentration. So be a doctor of public health in indigenous health, be the, the first of its kind in the world right here at Johns Hopkins. And then also what we're calling wise practices. We need evidence-based practices, but every time I hear that term, I ask whose evidence is it? Where was the evidence generated? And if it worked effectively in Baltimore, Maryland, does it mean it's going to work effectively in Kyle, South Dakota? Maybe, but maybe not. We have to recognize there's a context, right? There's a context to public health. It's a historical context, cultural context, uh, socioeconomic context, linguistic context. So we have to be much smarter about this. And the Wise Practices movement really started with indigenous populations in Canada and recognizing that we need to adapt culturally and linguistically uh, evidence-based practices to be meaningful in the populations that we are trying to serve. So we know we have terrible disparities, and I won't spend too much time talking about that. We know that nationally, our obesity rates for American Indians and Alaska Natives are nearly 40%. Isn't that remarkable? Very, very high rates of obesity. And we also do see a lot of regional differences uh, in these patterns of overweight and obesity. And in the, the brown states, those are obesity rates between 45 and 50%, so nearly half the population. So for American Indians in North Dakota, Minnesota, Idaho, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma, incredibly high rates of obesity. Well, why is that? What has led to this, this epidemic of obesity and related chronic diseases? So we also have to recognize that there was a loss of food sovereignty and food systems, that we didn't always live on reservations, right? We had a domain over all of the territory and we had very healthy food systems. And when our populations were put onto reservations, we lost access to all of that food sovereignty and all of those food systems. And then it was replaced with uh, federal programs. And at the risk of being unpopular, some of the USDA programs really helped lead to some of the disparities that we're facing right now, right? So in addition to that loss of territory, loss of food systems, loss of culture, loss of language, uh, we also have to recognize that we have challenges with intergenerational poverty. So in addition to loss of all of that wonderful, healthy food systems, I mean, we used to have hundreds of varieties of corn. Now we just think of yellow sweet corn when we think of, of that food. And people had all kinds of beans and squash and uh, other types of healthy foods that they had in their diets that essentially went away once the reservation system started. So now when we think of traditional American Indian food, a lot of people think of Indian fry bread, right? Fry bread. 
But as tribes, we never fried dough, all right? That's not a traditional American Indian food. And the history of this and the source of fry bread is actually in the, the, the USDA Commodity Food Program. So there's what's called the FDPIR, the Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations. And on the right, that's a picture of an elder using commodity shortening and commodity flour to make fry bread. So in, in places where there's significant poverty, people are just doing the best they can with the supplies that they have. And we've seen a great deal of improvement in federal food programs, uh, particularly the food distribution program on Indian reservations. But historically, the foods were very unhealthy. We have to recognize that the food programs were not nutrition programs, they were economic programs, right? And it in, uh, included canned meat products, uh, spam-like, I'm not exactly sure what those were. Uh, these are things that I grew up with. I mean, the idea of government cheese, you know, this comes from this. Uh, they used to distribute what they called grape juice, which I think was just sugar water with purple food coloring. And then on the right, this is a container of pure corn syrup. And I know it's in very fine print, but it says, use in baby formula. Right? So we have to be cognizant of this history and recognize that there are reasons why we face such high rates of obesity and diabetes and other challenges. So some promising strategies that we've worked on uh, through our center, but also through colleagues around the country, looking at improving existing food programs. And again, through the commodity food programs, we've seen tremendous improvements in incorporation of more local foods now. There's always improvements to be made, but they've come a long way in terms of improving those uh, programs. But damage has been done to multiple generations of our populations. Promoting breastfeeding and early childhood nutrition uh, WIC has also done a much better job of promoting breastfeeding in recent decades, but when I was a full-time clinician in one of the tribes in Arizona, the, the WIC program was basically a baby formula distribution center, just handing out all, just a remarkable amount of baby formula to the extent that our population had the highest rate of formula feeding, even though we were living in poverty. And we know through the data that the population of formula-fed infants grow up to have higher rates of diabetes than breastfed infants. So we, this has to be a part of our solution as well. We need to promote food sovereignty and access to traditional foods. This is happening on a small scale in many of our populations, but we need it to be scaled up to make a, a larger impact. Expanding locally cultivated foods. And what's happening in a couple of uh, communities is taxing unhealthy foods and subsidizing healthier options. I work with a tribe in Minnesota, and they have this wonderful wellness center, and it's used actively by many of the youth. They have basketball programs and other sports that the kids really enjoy. But their vending machines, they were just selling all kinds of sugar-sweetened uh, sugar -sweetened beverages. So what they did was subsidize bottled water. So the water was 25 cents, and the soda was $1.25, and guess what? Water consumption went up. There are some policy things that we can do. Some tribes are actually taxing unhealthy foods and the sugar sweetened beverages. So I know it's controversial in some sectors, but the data are pointing in a good direction. When we look at these types of policy solutions, it just needs further study. We need to elucidate more data out of these opportunities. And it, it certainly worked for uh, cigarette smoking. Perhaps it'll work in some of these other arenas that we need to address. So those are a few of the references. I'm looking forward to hearing the other panelists and certainly also looking forward to uh, the question and answer session. So thank you all very much, appreciate it. Hi everyone, I'm Sherry Fry with Nielsen IQ. Um, you heard about us this morning in a little bit of the ultra process conversation with some of the research. Um, I am, uh, we were formerly, for some of you, you may be like Nielsen IQ, is that Nielsen? We did used to be part of the Nielsen company. We've split apart. There is still a company called Nielsen that watches what people watch. We actually look at what people buy and who those consumers are. And that's what I thought I would share with you a little bit today and pulling a bit of the thread of the economic polarization through. Um, you know, one of the things that we are finding in the US and in globally is that there has just been this increased polarization financially of consumers. And you know, this shrinking of the middle class, and we really see that about 72% of consumers are vulnerable, and we've been tracking very closely over the last few years, this group of yellow consumers who, you know, basically say that they're unchanged, but quite frankly, 
act like um, very vulnerable consumers when they are stressed. Now this is something that we, like I said, we're seeing in the US, but we're seeing globally. I think it was nice to see for the first time in January when we did this research that we found that um, we are starting to see there are more consumers who are saying, I feel like I'm, I'm rebounding, I'm, I'm thriving, I'm actually um, unchanged. I should also say, by the way, so when in, when in terms of some of the data that you're going to see today, it's going to be a combination of consumer research that we have, but also we're tracking sales data, everything that goes through a you know, register, any sort of any place where food is sold, from a convenience store to a drug store to online, um, and we also then track the consumer panel, and, and I'll show you some interesting things that are happening from a health aspect on that front. So looking at the kind of map of the US, one of the things that we've been looking at is nutrient density and where are foods that are nutrient dense and health, healthful sold. Um, and so this is nutrient index, indexing of nutrient dense foods as well as produce, uh, fruits and vegetables. And you can see just in general, and I, by the way, this is not at all a correlation. I'm just showing you um, here you know, with, uh, on the right hand side, diabetes, hypertension, and heart failure in terms of what that looks like. Um, but you can see this, you know, challenges and struggles in, in particular from the South. We have also been working with Feeding America for over a decade. We've been supplying our data to them to map the meal gap. And I will tell you, and for, for many of you that are in this space, you know that um, the map looks pretty similar when it comes to food insecurity as well um, from a U.S. standpoint. And I think in particular when we, when we look at that, you know, I think the, some of the most recent research that came out of our map, the meal gap, you know, 9 out of 10 consumers in, in every county, or 9 out of 10 counties, it is, um, it's a diverse consumer, you know, predominantly that are food insecure versus, um, versus yeah, non-diverse consumers. So I mentioned, you know, this consumer panel. So we have longitudinally tracked consumers that, that they self-report. So this is them telling us, me or someone in my household is struggling with this ailment. We track about 47 ailments every year. We actually just started tracking depression and anxiety a couple years ago, and quite frankly, we were really shocked to see 25% of households that were reporting and saying, yes, we, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Me or someone in my household is, is struggling with that, or 22%, I guess. Um, so what I wanted to show you, I know this is a busy chart, and by the way, my email is on the, the back page of the, the deck. If this isn't sent out, email me. We'll send you all these slides, plus, plus some other slides if, if you're interested on, on SNAP and what's happening there. Um, but when you look at this, you know, I think it's really clear, um, it is a busy chart, but on the, in that little gray on the right, that is what we're seeing in terms of our total panel, the share of the panelists that are saying, yes, I'm, I'm struggling with this ailment. On the right, in the darker, it is low-income households, and you can pretty much eyeball that pretty quickly and see, if you're in a low-income household, you are three to five times more likely to have many of these ailments, and in particular, many of these that are tied to food, diet, um, the only one here of the second, uh, in the second row, second from the bottom, the only one that's equal is high blood pressure, which is about 30% for low-income households, 30% for our total panel. I will tell you, though, that this is, I know we talked about it a little bit this morning in terms of sodium. This is one of the top things that I am asked about, you know, constantly, which is the amount of sodium that's in our, our food, you know, in our data, because we're tracking um, the nutrition label, we're tracking the ingredients, we're showing that about 26% of our food in the U.S., food and beverage, is, has over 300 milligrams of sodium per serving. So when you think about what this chart will continue to look like in the future, you know, there are clearly, clearly are negative, negative implications. You know, the only one where you actually see a flip-flop is you, in allergies, non-food allergies, where you see higher, higher income or total panel um, indexing higher than the lower income consumers. But again, I think just really drives home the impact on our health um, in, from an income standpoint. Now we've also done some looking at what is in the basket of a vulnerable consumer. And so we did this actually, we looked at in the US, we looked at the UK, and we looked at France. And they were pretty consistent in terms of what we saw with a couple of disparities. So um, just highlighting here what you can see, you can see the, you know, the light blue shows you baby, the, the dark blue shows you tobacco and smoking sorts of products. You can see um, you know, different sorts of things. Yellow is frozen, green is sweets and sweet desserts. One thing we saw differently, we actually saw less alcohol in the vulnerable consumers in the US than we did in France and in the UK, but we did see more sweets in the US baskets than we did in the other two countries. 
Now, because we, you know, we're always trying to look at our data to understand is there something here, uh, as I mentioned, you know, on the previous slide, we do see that low-income households tend to have more ailments. What we wanted to do on the right-hand side, what we, we took a look at, what are those low-income households that don't have a lot of ailments? What are they doing? What are they buying? And we found that they were over-indexing. They tend to, again, to have babies in the household. They actually drank alcohol, um, but they very, very uh, highly over-indexed on produce and vegetables. They didn't buy, they didn't actually buy beauty products, which was kind of an interesting thing. They did not buy smoking. They very, uh, very much under-indexed on smoking, tobacco sorts of products. And they also under-indexed on you know, different categories, breads and, and high carbohydrate related categories. Again, just kind of starting to look at our data to say, is there a there there? Is there something to understand with bringing these data sets together? We also track SNAP and WIC consumers. And so we have been looking at this, and you know, one of the big questions that we have gotten over the last year was, did people eat healthier when they had the incremental benefits? And we actually did find that yes. Um, and so this, again, we've got, we've got a whole presentation on that. You're, if you, if you want to dive into SNAP, we will share that with you. Um, I think the biggest takeaway that we found, though, was um, you could see that drop. You know, and, and, and I should call out the fact that you know, we track this thing called Better For. And it really is this idea of better for health, better for society, and better for the planet. And that, um, that you can see the growth. You can also see just general products with wellness claims for these SNAP consumers. And then you can see of clearly the drop when the benefits went away. We looked at this across categories. We saw that they, you know, there was an increased consumption when they had the incremental benefits uh, for produce categories, for products with claims you know, around things like diabetes. Um, and so, and, and by the way, I, I should have mentioned, you know, when we, on the, the diabetes slide, you know, we've done a lot of work specifically on diabetes, and we have actually tracked, and because that is, a, that is definitely an ailment that, um, you know, disproportionately affects diverse communities, we've done a lot of work, and we've actually matched our data with health records, and we have seen that um, when consumers do make a change and they pull back on key categories, you know, different sorts of categories, they actually do drop their A1C levels. So we've physically seen that, that impact of the changes from a consumer standpoint. Um, so again, we just wanted to share a little bit of what we're seeing, a little bit of a, a different lens from the, the economic aspect, but because we think it's an important element of looking at, at uh, all the consumers. So thanks so much. That's my slide, all right. Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie Goodwin. Um, I'm the Director of Nutrition Policy for Didn't Know North America. I focus a lot on federal and nutrition initiatives, policies, and partnerships. Um, <clears throat> so I think a lot about nutrition, health equity, food equity, nutrition security for the population. And I'm here today to share a little bit more about um, our journey with Danone and Danone North America and how we're thinking about our business and our mission as it relates to health equity and, and like I said, more specifically on food and nutrition equity. Um, have you heard of Danone? Show of hands. You know who we are? All right, good. Because uh, I could spend all day explaining who we are and what our brands are, which I will do a little bit, but I just, I figured I know a lot of you and, and you know the company. Um, you know, Danone has long recognized that health is not a privilege but a fundament, fundamental right for all, and that may be not something you really knew about us. Um, and so I have a few examples of the things that we're thinking about um, in, in this space. And before I get there, this is, I always like this slide because this is where we started. Um, we're a 100-year-old yogurt company, started in Europe, and then we came over to the Bronx um, and, and sold yogurt in the 1940s. And really, this is sort of the beginning of our mission of health through food to as many people as possible. But since then, um, <clears throat> we've grown to be a global business, and we've got dairy, yogurt, plant-based foods, and so we get to be in between those conversations of dairy and plant-based. Um, coffee, beverages, medical foods, you may know us more about uh, some of these brands like Dan and Oikyo's Too Good, Activia, Silk, and So Delicious. Um, but, you know, regardless of us uh, expanding our category from dairy yogurt in those tiny little porcelain jars, um, 
our mission really has stayed the same of bringing health through uh, food to as many people as possible. And that, um, that mission has sort of guided and been our framework or architect, I would say, for a lot of the, the next set of framing that we have. Um, and, you know, I recently talked about this in, an, in another talk, but uh, in 2023, our Denone Impact Journey was released, and this is our global framework that helps reinforce our mission and defines where and how we can, um, where we want to have positive, positive contribution. And so we have a few pillars, and some of them, it's health, nature, and peoples and communities. And there is, when I really looked into this and talked to a few people in, inside the company, there is examples of health equity in all of these pieces. Um, the other thing that we are is a B Corp certification. Um, and this is important to us. You know, it validates a lot of this work and framing that, that, that we do. Um, you know, we're on a journey as a business uh, to be used as a force to good, to, to do good, and ensure that our products are not only accessible by the wealthiest Americans, but to find ways to ensure more of our products are accessible by all. Um, you know, like our mission, this is, a, you know, we're a dual purpose company, this B Corp certification is really important to us. It's one of the highest standards to verify social environmental performance, transparency, and legal accountability. I mean, ultimately, all of these framing and the certification it ultimately helps create a more sustainable, equitable society for all. Look for the B Corp on all types of products. It's not just food, um, because that that is just another way that you, as a consumer, can help support this, these initiatives. And so, when it comes to health equity, um, you know, we're not just thinking about it in just health equity. We're thinking about how we can implement a strategy around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And and we're thinking about it in in four pillars: creating a diverse workforce um, and sustaining an inclusive environment. You know, we're ensuring DEI is considered across our broad networks of vendors, suppliers, and partners. And um, you know, the other the other piece here that well, the last piece that I really wanted to jump to, so I sort of jumped there, um, but is through advocacy, which is what I do a lot of, and trying to find partners and working with the Sustainable Food Policy Alliance. And you know, we we're working with experts to find um, policies that we can support that promotes equal, equality and justice. And this is really important to us thinking about sort of the systemic um, things going around uh, in our country. All right. Um, <clears throat> another piece that you may have heard me talk about before is our White House commitments. And I mean, we've talked about it uh, in various panels. And I'll just say that I've been in nutrition for over 20 years. I'm a dietitian. And I'm just really happy to see this White House commitment, or the White House Conference on Hunger Nutrition um, and Health and the national strategy. It's sort of bringing us all together to sort of you know, catapult, and someone else said catalyze, I like all of these words um, of us working together. And um, to Danone, like, I set up that framework, and this came about really quickly, and we were like, we want to be involved, we want to support this, we want to make commitments. And, and, so, and so we did, and um, I'm just going to provide a few examples um, from, this might be animated, it is, all right. Um, in the, in the three out of the four pillars that we made commitments in. And so the first one is um, we did a nutrition equality study. And um, what was really interesting about this study is, I mean, everyone in this room uh, thinking about being a food and nutrition citizen, I mean, we are all into this. Uh, but what was really interesting about this study is it showed that nutrition had risen to the top of the US agenda um, among all people in the U.S., um, and access to quality food is now ranked as one of the most important issues today alongside economy, jobs, and health care. That just gives credit to this sort of catapulting of keeping nutrition at the forefront of the agenda. Um, I've got a whole bunch of statistics here that I'm not going to read you, uh, but, you know, this is available and I can send it to you. I think the main points really are, though, that there wasn't an optimistic view in, in the folks that um, filled out the survey on uh, nutritious food accessibility. And in fact, they felt like it was getting worse, um, especially under, under um, certain communities. And you know, transportation is one of those things that came up, lack of transportation. 
Okay, I'll tell you what the most surprising thing was for me. Um, that people expected food companies to take action to progress food and nutrition equality. They felt like it's, it's an addition to federal and state government, but also retailers, food companies. Um, you know, I think having, they mentioned that food companies need to be involved in supporting uh, food systems and developing affordable products, as well as being uh, involved in education to help individuals. Um, okay, something I'm really proud of uh, is the Danone um, advocacy work um, for the WIC program. And I've been on the government affairs team now for about five years, just a little bit over, and um, it became really clear to me that the WIC program and the Danone mission have similar alignment of health through food to, you know, health and nutrition through food. And as I always joke around with Many of you have heard me say this before. I mean, like, it's, it's essentially the OG of food as medicine, right? And it's providing specific key nutrients um, to specific life stages, and it just doesn't get any better than that. And the fact that we were in an argument in Congress about whether or not to fully fund WIC is just beyond me. Um, and the coolest thing happened, though, uh, which is what I've, you know, whenever I've done any talks or I talk to you all, I'm like, we've got to find a way to collaborate here. Let's work here. How can we get other stakeholders involved, government, non-government, um, health organizations, and industry. Like, is that even possible? And, you know, when this WIC issue came up, we did all band together. It was kind of incredible. And um, anyway, it feels like a success. I hate that it even happened. But if there was a silver lining, I mean, like, we, we did it, right? Like, it's pretty cool. It got fully funded. And I hope we don't have to have that conversation again. But we probably will. And Danone is ready to completely support this and be involved with all of you on that. Okay, I'm going to stop talking about that. Um, okay, here's, I had a, when I reached out to many of my colleagues in Danone, I was like, what are all the things we're doing on health equity and nutrition security? And I got all these emails and um, I could spend all day talking about them. But this is one of the cool ones that um, I just wanted to share with you. And this comes from our Light and Fit team. Um, they launched the Empower Her Nutrition Education Grant Program to registered dietitians in the U.S. And these dietitians are passionate about improving equitable access to nutrition education and specifically for women and girls in their communities. Um, we received over 81 applications. We awarded five recipients. Um, and in the grants, what they'll do is it'll support these programs being developed um, and it'll also provide a stipend for the dietitians to go to uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, Food and Nutrition Conference. Um, I like listed them all here and I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, they're all pretty cool. Let me just pick one. Um, okay, so they're, one of the grantees, um, will, the program that's being developed will primarily reach low-income Hispanic adults and families in the area near Boston. There'll be dietitian-led grocery store tours with a focus on nutrition for women, educate how to shop, read labels, ingredients, thinking about nutrition for weight management, as well as how to help prevent from diet-related chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension. There are all these programs, you know, we're talking about cultural relevance here. This is what this is all about. Um, and there's gonna be another um, program in 2024, so tell your people, if you know anybody, um, to apply for the program. Okay, this is my last together side, and I hope it's not too dorky, but um, I mean, the idea here is like, I really believe in the power of what we did on WIC, and I think we can do more on health equity. I mean, we heard all about this, this the data that's going on um, with disparities, and uh, we can do better. Um, you know, for Danone, I think nutrition and food equity, it lies at the heart of our mission. And so these are just a few examples of how we're engaging, but I think we're open to continuing to build how we engage, how we advocate for policy, and, and how we work together. Um, I have all these like emotional things to say at the end that I don't think I'm gonna say. <laughs> anyway, so here's, well, here's one, okay. Um, you know, I think ensuring access to nourishing foods for all, regardless of socioeconomic status, geographical location, or where you come from, you know, we can create together a ripple effect of well-being through food, and I want to work with you on this. So that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, 
Dr. Brown, Dr. Warren, Sherry, and Dr. Goodwin, thank you all for your dynamic presentations. Let's give them another hand. Now we have about five minutes for questions. Um, I believe the microphone is here to my left, maybe to you all's right. Um, I will also just start off by asking the panelists to share one of the things that they find most exciting about the increasing efforts to apply, not just a health equity lens, but as Dr. Cotwright likes to emphasize, a health equity vision to evidence-based food policy work. Um, I will maybe say if you have a response to that, feel free to share it, but I want to make sure we also have time for audience questions. Yeah, uh, I think one of the exciting things is the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion across the board, and I know there's pushback in that space, but we need more people with lived experiences from the communities that we're working with, and I think we'll get better outcomes and even ask better research questions when we have more people with lived experience actually at the forefront of that effort. I can add something. Since I've been talking, I'll keep talking. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about is dietary guidelines and the health equity lens that the committee is taking. I think um, it's just, I can't wait to see what they say about it, but I think it's the future of how we think about the full dietary pattern and reaching um, diversity in the U.S. and the various cultures. Um, there, we know that there's ways to meet nutrition. Um, in various culturally like relevant meals, and I think it's just a matter of the data catching up to make those recommendations that then will filter in to all the federal programs. So I will second the excitement about the dietary guidelines and integration of health equity, um, but I also want to share a program that I serve as a coordinator for at NIH. It's called Compass for Short, Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society, and the goal of that program, it's a common fund program, basically common fund at NIH is like the venture capitalists of NIH, uh, Precision, um, NPH Nutrition for Precision Health, powered by the All of Us program is one of our common fund programs, but Compass is another. Uh, but it's simulating uh, health equity and community-led structural interventions. So the innovative part is that it's community-driven, so I think there's excitement around that for community-driven organizations uh, to be the lead of the research. Um, so obviously, working from for a federal agency, I think it's important for it to be top top down, but also bottom up, and really engaging communities, uh, similar to what you mentioned, Dr. Warren, about really centering lived experience and those who are working on the ground in this health equity space. So. I think I would just um, add one thing that I'm, I'm personally excited about. So we, you know, we work with government organizations, nonprofits, but our primary clients are cli you know, the food industry, manufacturers, as well as retailers. And I will tell you what has been really exciting for me has been that is, there's been a marked change in the conversation and the questions that we are being asked. And you know, when we look at um, some of the stats you were showing in terms of where is growth coming from, it is coming from diverse audiences. But the second question is, you know, how do we make sure that we are serving them? Because you, you know, you're not winning and you're not growing if you're selling high fat, high calorie, you know, high sugar foods to those audiences. And so those are the types of conversations, you know, that we are really seeing shifting. danone has been leading the way for a long time, but we're really seeing it across the entire food and, and retail industry. So I'm personally excited. I want to share that with with those you that are not on the manufacturer or retailer space. Awesome. Is this on? Yes, I see we have two folks standing up. Is there anyone else that might want to join the queue? If not, we'll just have our, our two folks here. Please say your name and your organization. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Karen Ahrens, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, while we're trying to measure and weigh and, and see what changes come about in what people purchase and eat, um, how do we capture or take into account the food that's shared? Um, it might be grown in a garden and shared with others. It might be a food sovereignty project um, wh where there's not consumers, like people just buying things, but they're growing or producing food together. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh do the first attempt at an, uh, answering that. That's a great question, and, and we're seeing this in a lot of our communities, aren't we, with community gardens, and particularly uh, in some of the tribal communities that I work with, and uh, we're not collecting the data regarding those types of uh, uh, food consumption. So 
Um, I think it's an important question, and, and we do need to think about that in terms of evaluating programs. And quite often when we have impoverished communities just trying to establish a public health intervention, they don't always have data collection and evaluation plans in mind when they start those things. But maybe that's our role in academics and in other sectors is to assist with the data collection because I agree that's a very important component to show that there's value in doing this and we need to have the data to show it. So great question. Anyone else? Hi, thank you guys. My name is Natalie Castro. I've been working in um, the healthcare sector for the last 16 years trying to change the food environment and the products that we're serving our patients and the community through healthcare, um, trying to use food as medicine. So I'm curious to know, um, so my struggle <laughs> has been getting product. Um, so while there's many products, and this is to Stephanie, that um, we have available, it just isn't getting to where it needs to be, it seems. So for the last 16 years, <laughs> I've been trying to get a non-sweet um, soy milk or a plant-based option. So we've had a plant-based option available, but it's been loaded in sugar. Um, so I'm just curious as to if you can speak on that, if there's been any focus on trying to get the better products that are available in the industry to the right, um, where we need it to be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think <clears throat> I'll just add, maybe your frustration will end here in the next 16 years, I don't know. Um, but you know, with food as medicine, the whole movement moving forward, I mean, it's what we do as nutrition, right? It's just nutrition. Um, and the people are really realizing how important that nutrition is. Um, and what you're talking about is sort of that final stretch of like getting that that product into the hospital. I don't, I mean, you're moving into like sales channels and I don't know how that works um, entirely, but I can tell you from various conversations, even thinking about school meals, um, WIC, uh, and just other retailers, you know, we, we have unsweetened um, plant-based products and soy milk being the recommendation right now from the dietary guidelines, unsweetened. And um, the feedback that we get is we need demand for it. So I think my perspective is that it's, I always call it a sandwich. I don't know if that's the right way to think about it. But like you need that, that grassroots, grassroots um, support to say we then demand for this in, in those facilities. And then you need top down food as medicine policies and regulations and those administrators ex, you know, accepting that. And, and I think the two of those coming together will potentially help. Sorry, I just want to comment um, yeah. because I, I agree totally uh, supply and demand, but I feel that demand is on the sugar products. So how do we ever change that? I guess it's a question for this whole conference. Um, but you know, we're going to continue to run into this. Um, as a mother of small children, it's almost impossible to find foods for children that don't have added sugars in it um, or clean labels. Um, so. Yes, I hear that it is a supply and demand, but it's also, I think it's happening simultaneously where the products are available and the only products available are the, the, sweetened, uh, the sweetened products. Because um, it is very difficult, you know, you, I mean, we just had some guidelines come out or some recommendations come out for yogurt being considered a healthy food and now it's impossible to find a unsweetened um, yogurt <laughs> on the market. You know, if your grocer carries it, if you know Target has it or whoever, um, the options are very limited. So I'm just well, and I'll, I'll just add. I mean, we're making a huge attempt in that area, um, innovating products. That's what our commitment to for the White House commitments that we did, and so it's no sugar added or low sugar added um, products. So I know that's from our company, but I think again, like continuing the demand would be really good, and then. It's like an education demand policy all coming together um, that will hopefully improve that food environment for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. Give, give, her, give her a round of applause for her. I, I really